I'm really excited to talk with everyone today. My name is Diana Fiara, and I'm going to talk to everyone today about the management of obesity. So in terms of objectives, we're going to have about four buckets that I want everyone to learn about today. So we'll discuss the diagnosis of obesity. And by the end of today, I hope you can answer why we use BMI, but then also why we should be critical of that as a tool. Regarding diets and exercise, I want you to walk away understanding what diets really work for weight loss. And when it comes to exercise, what role does exercise have in weight management? For medications, you should know by the end of this what the various medications for weight loss are and how well do they work. And regarding surgery, I want you to be able to know what the various surgical options for weight loss are at this time. So to start, I just want to chat really briefly about what causes obesity. While there are very rare monogenic causes of obesity that present in very young children, the majority of cases of obesity in adults and also in most children are not monogenic, which means they're not caused by just one gene. The fact is that there are many obesity-promoting genes in an obesity-promoting world. And so what we know is that there are over 50 genes that are associated with obesity. The causation is not clearly there, but we do see in GWAS studies that in individuals with obesity, there are over 50 genes that we see in higher rates in individuals with obesity. But we also know that when it comes to obesity, our genes are not our destiny. So what happens is that we live in an environment with very highly processed, energy-dense foods and in a world that is very sedentary. So there's a big mismatch in the world in which we as humans evolved and the current environment when it comes to access to food and our energy output. So this combination of genes that are associated with obesity and this environment that promotes obesity that is probably why we are seeing higher rates of obesity now. Uh, but that is also to say that through changes in our, our environment and the lifestyle choices that we make and the medications we have access to, we don't have to sort of live the destiny of those obesity promoting genes. So let's start with diagnosing obesity. The main way we in the medical community diagnose obesity right now is by using BMI, which is a very simple equation that looks at someone's weight in kilograms divided by their height in meters squared. So with that number, we have a few categories. We have normal weight, overweight, and then obesity. Obesity is defined as a BMI greater than or equal to 30. And we've really moved away from using words like morbid obesity and severe obesity to use less stigmatizing, less biased type language and classifying obesity based on class one, class two, and class three obesity. The key here though, is to point out there, there are several limitations associated with, OB, with the use of BMI to diagnose obesity. The main is understanding the history of how BMI was created. So BMI was created in the 1800s to define what the quote, ideal weight to height ratio should be for a white man to have good health. This number was then brought to the US and modified a little bit more again in a white male population. And as we all know, we don't exist in a world just of white men. So how do we take a simple equation and extrapolate it to the rest of the population? Over time and more recently, we have seen studies show that racial groups experience different rates of cardiometabolic disease at different BMIs. So for Asian and Asian Americans, this includes people of the Indian subcontinent, we know that this population has higher rates of cardiometabolic disease at lower BMIs. So the Jocelyn uh, Endocrinology Department at Harvard has done a lot of great work on this and has actually created a different BMI cutoff for Asian and Asian American patients. And we know that at around a BMI of 27, we see those higher rates 
of cardiometabolic disease. So that's the BMI cutoff for obesity in this population. The converse is true in our black patients, specifically black women, when we look at population-based studies, they have lower morbidity and mortality at rates of class one obesity. And so it's really in that class two ob obesity range where we start to see equal levels of mortality when we compare to other racial groups at a BMI of similar rates. In terms of gender, we know that women have different body composition than men with higher rates of adiposity. And so it's hard to know exactly how to use this BMI tool simplistically in women. And we in the medical community very readily accept that people who have extremes of muscle mass are not going to be able to use BMI the same way. So in our athletes who have very high rates of muscle and low rates of adipose tissue, BMI is falsely elevated. And the converse is true for our sarcopenic patients who have lower muscle mass and higher adiposity ratios. Their BMIs are going to be falsely lowered. So what are the takeaways here? BMI is a good screening tool at the population level. Uh, we know it's a sensitive tool, which means we may be over-diagnosing obesity using BMI. And so what we as clinicians need to do is challenge the notion of treating someone just based on their BMI. We should use that as a screening tool and then look at our patients as individuals, understand their nutrition, activity regimens, and look at the comorbidities associated with obesity to see if they're at higher risk and use the big picture uh, that that patient presents with and not just treat a weight number or a BMI. So the crux of obesity treatment is lifestyle change. Everything we do has lifestyle change at the base of that pyramid. And what do we think about when we talk about lifestyle change? Well, we break it down into diet and exercise. So first we'll talk about the role of diet and weight loss. To start the conversation, we should briefly address what are macronutrients. So I'm sure you all have heard about macronutrients. They are carbohydrates, protein, and fats. And these are vital nutrients your body uses in the largest amounts for energy. Fiber and water are also very important to the body, but they don't have calories, so they're not considered macronutrients. Micronutrients, on the other hand, we use in smaller amounts, and those are things like minerals and vitamins. And so the question I always get, and I'm sure you get, or you may yourself wonder is, do macronutrient-focused diets work? So do things like the keto diet, is that superior to something like the Ornish diet or the paleo diet? And the resounding answer is no. Macronutrient composition does not affect weight loss. And so this has been proven time and time again through many randomized control trials, as well as meta-analyses that have summarized the data. But over and over again, for decades at this point, we've seen through research that there's no macronutrient diet that's better than another when it comes to weight loss. And so what does this mean? What should you be doing in terms of your diet if you're trying to lose weight or help someone in your life lose weight? The overall goal is some type of calorie reduction. And we give a general rule of thumb of if you decrease your calories by about 500 calories a day from what you're doing, you should be able to lose about one pound a week. Now that's not going to be the case for everyone, but that is a sort of a simple equation to start. The key is over someone's lifetime, weight cycling can be very harmful. So we want to create sustainable lifestyle changes. So the diet for someone that they should be on is the diet that they can adhere to the longest because we don't want to promote weight loss that's not sustainable because every time you lose weight, your metabolism slows down permanently. If you go back to how you were eating before, you'll gain weight and probably more than you had initially been because your metabolism is now slower. And we see that in weight cycling throughout someone's lifetime, they probably gain more weight and at a higher weight than they would have been if they had never dieted in the first place. And that's really related to that slowing of metabolism. 
Another big key when it comes to diet is portion control is key. This is a really great way to help people reduce calories. We want to prioritize non-starchy vegetables, lean proteins, and high fiber carbohydrates. So the way I think about it and talk about it with my patients is based on an image like this, which is the Harvard Healthy Eating Plate. And so you can think of your plate as your two hands put together. One hand should be non-starchy vegetables. And those can be prepared any way you want, baked, sauteed, raw in the form of a salad, grilled, really anything but deep fried. And if you are cooking it, you want to make sure you measure out the fat to about a tablespoon. And ideally, it would be a healthy oil. When it comes to protein, your serving should be about the size of a deck of cards or your palm. And your starch should be something that's minimally processed and really high in fiber. And you want to keep that to about the size of a cup or the size of your fist. And then the third bit to promote a healthy lifestyle is to really focus on fresh and minimally processed foods. We know that as foods become more processed, they lose their natural nutrients and they gain more calories from things like sugar and unhealthy fats. So the more we can eat foods that look like we could go outside and get on our own, the better it's going to be both for weight loss, but also just for overall health and well-being. So intermittent fasting, I bring this up not because it's the ideal diet, but because it's a super hot topic right now. So what is intermittent fasting? Well, there's a handful of types, but the overall concept is reducing the number of hours you eat in a day. So the most common and probably easiest type of intermittent fasting to do is something called time-restricted eating. And this is where you fast for 16 hours of the day and eat for eight. The other forms of intermittent fasting are a little bit harder because the fast is a little bit longer. So the 5-2 model is where you're eating ad lib, so whatever you want for five days of the week. And then on two days, you're only eating 500 calories. The alternate fast, alternate day fasting diet is where you're eating whatever you want one day and then 500 calories the next day. And you just kind of ping pong off of that. And then the eat, stop, eat is where you're eating ad lib six days of the week and one full 24 hours of the week, you fast completely. And so the theory is that if we restrict the time we're eating and we restrict the food and the macronutrients we're getting, instead of using those macronutrients for energy, your body will tap into fat stores. And by tapping into fat stores, we can promote weight loss, but also preferentially burn fat over muscle to preserve some of that metabolism that gets lost when people lose weight. Ideally, then that would be easier for people to maintain weight loss in the long run. It, additionally to just the weight loss bit, we have seen health benefits of intermittent fasting in animal models. So we see improvements in memory and cognition. We see improvements in cardiovascular health through things like reduced heart rate and improved blood pressure. And then we also see improved glucose tolerance. Again, these were in animal models. And when we look at the human studies, the results just have not been consistent enough to say that this really is panning out in humans right now. So the question for me in the weight management world and the question I'm sure a lot of you have as well is, does intermittent fasting lead to weight loss? So we can look at the studies. There have been about 30 trials that have been published to date that look at intermittent fasting in individuals with obesity or overweight to assess if there is weight loss. And we can divide these studies into two groups. One group is just looking at intermittent fasting in individuals with obesity and comparing that to individuals with obesity who are doing nothing differently in their, in their lifestyle. And then the other group of studies is comparing intermittent fasting to the gold standard of weight, weight loss counseling now, which is calorie restriction. So that would be in this IF plus CR group. So first we can look at the intermittent fasting alone studies. And what we found is that when we compare individuals with obesity or overweight, 
who are either doing no dietary changes or intermittent fasting, the intermittent fasting group does lose weight. Now, it's important to note that these studies have very variable study designs, and they also do not last very long. So the study duration is only about two to 12 weeks. And the active phase of weight loss really is closer to six months to one year. So it's hard to really assess what can, what can we extrapolate from a 12-week diet intervention. Uh, but what the studies have shown is a wide, a wide range of weight loss from about 1% to 10% when you compare intermittent fasting to someone not doing anything for nutrition or lifestyle change. When we look at intermittent fasting versus calorie restriction when it comes to weight loss in individuals with obesity or overweight, the results are different. The results are that both groups lose weight, but there is no difference between the intermittent fasting and the calorie restriction. So again, very variable study design, various duration, but there have been very well done randomized control trials in this space that have been up to a year. And they show that both groups lose weight from a range of four to 12%, but that weight loss is the same. And so what does this tell us? Well, this says that intermittent fasting is not the silver bullet for weight loss. It really is decreasing the amount of calories you have in a day that helps with weight loss. And what they also saw in the studies was that there was no preferential burning of adiposity. So intermittent fasting, this theory that will tap into our fat stores first, really doesn't pan out when we look in human studies. When someone's doing calorie restriction or intermittent fasting plus calorie restriction, the weight loss is the same and the rate of fat to muscle loss is also the same. But when may this be a good idea? So this might be good for someone who eats many, many hours of the day and needs a hard cutoff or something more structured. Or it could be really good for someone who's having a hard time with calorie restriction. And then on the other side of the coin, when would this be a bad idea? Well, it's not a good good thing for patients who have eating disorder or a history of eating disorder because intermittent fasting can increase food fixation. So we don't want to promote restriction or too much thinking or obsession around food in this way because it can promote or trigger eating disorders in individuals. So I'll pause also now to talk about the microbiome and obesity. The microbiome is fascinating and we're learning a lot about the role of our gut health and our overall well being and our full physical body health. When it comes to obesity, the mice models have shown that there are different ratios of certain bacteria found in obese mice versus lean mice. So, in obese mice, we can find the Firmicutes to Bacteroides ratio favoring the Firmicutes bacteria, whereas the converse is true in lean mice. And interestingly, in fecal transplant studies, where they take the fecal matter from a lean mouse, transplant it into an obese mouse to totally change the gut microbiome, those individuals with those mice, sorry, with obesity become lean. And so that tells us, is there something about this ratio of bacteria that promotes ob obesity? And in mice, that definitely seems to be the case. But again, when we look in human models, the results are much more variable. So yes, we still see this a similar ratio of Firmicutes to Bacteroides being higher in individuals with obesity, but there are also many other bacteria that are found more commonly in individuals with obesity and vice versa. In individuals who are lean, we see other types of bacteria being more common. But when we've tried fecal transplant studies, we haven't seen the same level of results. So I think with the microbiome and obesity, just like the microbiome in a lot of our health right now, it's too early to really say how this is going to impact obesity treatment and whether or not there's a, a real, uh, again, silver bullet here with the microbiome. But it's still good to think about how to optimize your microbiome because we know it can help with your gut health, with your immunity and your overall well being. So, what should you do? Focus on eating probiotics through food. 
So fermented foods have the most probiotics, things like yogurt, kimchi, sour, kraut, kefir. Those are great ways to get my, to get probiotics. It's actually better than taking the probiotic shots or the pills. So if there's a way for you to eat it naturally from food, that should be what you should focus on. And then we also want to eat pro, eat prebiotics. So prebiotics are foods that create a great environment in your gut for those probiotic bacteria to grow and thrive. So really great prebiotics include legumes, certain fruit, and allium vegetables. So things like onions, garlic, shallots, and then some other vegetables as well, like greens. Eating a high fiber diet can also create a good environment for those healthy gut bacteria. And then what should we eat less of? Well, we wanna avoid sugar and processed foods. Those types of things like processed sugar and foods create a negative environment in your gut. And so they actually promote the growth of sort of the less helpful and healthy bacteria. And then to the best of your ability, you should avoid antibiotics because they do clean out your gut. That being said, if you need antibiotics because you have an infection, you should take them. But we should try our best to not take antibiotics for things that might be on the fence whether or not it might help. So what do we think about exercise? Uh, so in terms of exercise guidelines, the American College of Sports Medicine and the CDC have joint guidelines which recommend 150 minutes of moderate intensity per week for aerobic activity, and then strength training twice a week. The key here is that these guidelines are to prevent weight gain in adulthood. These are not guidelines to promote weight loss. So can we exercise alone to promote weight loss? Do we really need to focus on nutrition so much? I hear this question a lot. And the reason is because exercise creates a negative energy expenditure state. And if all we're trying to do is reduce our calorie intake by 500 calories a day, why can't we just do that through exercise to lose weight? We know that this just does not work. So studies have shown, and we'll go through some of the information, but the studies show that exercise alone does not promote weight loss. And we aren't exactly sure why, but there are theories about metabolic and psychologic compensation to exercise that makes it harder to lose weight. So when we look at studies looking at just aerobic exercise, when someone's doing the 150 minutes of aerobic exercise a week, there's no weight loss. And that's even for someone who is going from no exercise to the 150 minutes a week. We do start to see meaningful amounts of weight loss when people approach 300 minutes of exercise a week. And how can we think about that? Well, that's about an hour a day for five days a week. So if someone is able to exercise pretty hard for an hour a day, five days a week, that's when we start to see weight loss. The challenging part with this, however, is that time is usually one of the biggest barriers for our patients. And so if we're able to devote some of that energy to nutrition and some of that energy to exercise, we'll see a lot more weight loss. So it's better to try and focus on those early stages on optimizing nutrition and health that way and building up the exercise piece over time. And then what about anaerobic exercise? If we're lifting weights and building our muscle mass, can we preserve our metabolism and lose weight? Well, the studies are resounding that it's very, very challenging and unlikely to have any body weight loss with anaerobic exercise on its own. When it comes to maintaining weight loss, so keeping off the weight you lose after that year, we know that exercise plays an integral role here, and we want patients to be doing activity 200 minutes to 300 minutes a week. So it's important to build up those skills and start carving out that time. But again, it's more important in the maintenance phase rather than that active initial weight loss time. However, exercise has great health benefits. So besides weight loss, we see improvements in insulin sensitivity, blood pressure, and cardiorespiratory fitness, regardless of whether or not someone loses weight. So exercise is good. The point of this is not to say we should ignore exercise, 
But the point is more that exercise alone has minimal impact on initial weight loss. It's super critical for keeping the weight off. And it's also good for your overall health. So if we're trying to pick one thing to focus on early on, let's pick diet. But if someone loves to be active or it really energizes them and motivates them, you should harness that as well. But just be mindful that the nutrition piece is also key. And we can't let go of the nutrition piece if we're really trying to focus on weight loss. So to summarize this big section of lifestyle change, diet and calorie reduction are key to initial weight loss, but no macronutrient diet is superior for weight loss. The key is sticking to the diet you can maintain for the longest amount of time. We do not want to promote weight cycling because in the long term, that can promote more weight gain. And what do we want to eat? Well, we really want to focus on eating fiber rich and minimally processed foods. And exercise is great. It has amazing health benefits and it's key for maintenance of weight loss, but on its own, it may not contribute to initial weight loss. So what's next? So as I mentioned at the beginning, lifestyle change is really the foundation of all of our work. And so that's why I start there. And then the next level, so for our patients who may not be losing enough weight through lifestyle change alone, or they need to do something more intensive, that's when we think about medications. So I'd like to start with just a timeline of medications for weight loss. So the 1950s is when we really first saw weight loss medications hit the market, and these were amphetamine derivatives, and they were things like fentermine. Fentermine only lasted for about a decade before we started to see that the doses that we were using them were really high and they were ca causing cardiovascular effects. And we were starting to see that people were abusing stimulants. So time passes. And then in the 1970s, we have a new wave of serotonin releasing agents. And this was fenfluramine. We started to see that there was some primary pulmonary hypertension associated with this. But what we saw more in the 90s was that if we combined fenfluramine and fentermine to fenfen, people would have even better weight loss. So even though there were these red flags about these medications separately, instead of sort of putting them aside, the drug companies decided to combine them into fenfen. And I think fenfen has scarred a generation um, because of the terrible side effects so fenfen was pulled from the market due to valvular disease and cardiovascular disease. That was sort of the end of the, the stimulant uh, and short-term medications for weight loss. And the late 90s brought in our first medication for weight loss that was FDA approved for long-term use. And that's Orlistat, which is a life, lipase inhibitor. And it's something that's still available to patients. The 2010s was a really prolific time for our current uh, philosophy around medications for weight loss. And this is when we started seeing medications that were meant for long-term use. So in 2010, or sorry, 2012, Qsimia was FDA approved. And the, this is a combo pill that we'll talk a little bit more about. And that same year, Lorcaserin, which is which was known as Belvique, was also approved by the FDA. Belvique was pulled from the market in 2020 by the FDA because there was an increased risk of cancer, specifically pancreatic, colorectal, and lung cancer. 2014 brought another generation of medications for weight loss. That's when we saw Contrave, as well as the first GLP-1 receptor agonist, Sixenda, hit the market for our patients. And then 2021 is when we had a huge splash with Wagovi, uh, another GLP-1 receptor agonist coming on board. Um, and 2023 may bring Manjaro to the obesity medicine space. Manjaro was FDA approved in 2022 for diabetes, and it's currently being fast tracked for use in obesity medicine. So I'll pause here to really do the med school part of the mini med school. And let's just briefly talk about the physiology of obesity. So energy homeostasis, which is that balance of calories we're taking in and calories we're burning should be regulated at the level of the hypothalamus in the brain. We evolved as humans to consume food in a way that matched our body's use of our energy through food. 
And so there's this complex set of hormones from the periphery that go to the brain and say, I'm hungry, I need more food, or I'm not really burning too many calories, I don't need more food. And then the brain sends back signals to the body to tell the body to eat more. And the reason I bring this up now is because traditionally, since you know the 2012 time and onwards, the medications for weight loss have mostly focused on regulating this process in the brain. However, we know that present day humans, we eat for reasons that have nothing to do with energy homeostasis. And so that's why medications for weight loss aren't really a long term, have not been a long term solution for most people because we can out eat our energy homeostasis. So yeah, that that's just a, a thing to consider when we talk about medications for weight loss. Here's a quick list of the medications that are currently FDA approved, and we'll go through the majority of them. Orlistat is a medication that does not have very good weight loss effects. It's only about 3%, so I'm not going to talk about it, but I'll go through the rest of the medications. To start, when do we use them? So medications are indicated for individuals with obesity. So if you have a BMI greater than or equal to 30 or a BMI of greater than or equal to 27 with a comorbidity, they are an adjunctive tool to lifestyle change. So when we look at the studies that were done for medications for weight loss, every study had individuals doing, doing lifestyle change with calorie reduction and exercise. Medications are meant for long-term use. They are not meant for short-term kickstarting the weight loss process. Obesity is a chronic disease, and these medications are meant to be used chronically. To date, we don't see any reduction in morbidity and mortality when we look at medications for weight loss in individuals with obesity. Part of that is because the drug companies have not been looking at it in the long run, I suspect because they don't think there will be reduction in morbidity and mortality. But the hope is with these newer medications, they actually are going to look at them in the long run. So hopefully in five or 10 years, I'll have something better to report here. So let's start with the GLP-1 receptor agonists. Right now, there are two FDA approved medications for weight loss in the GLP-1 receptor agonist family. One is Sixenda, which is the brand name for liraglutide, and the other is Wagovi, which is the brand name for semaglutide. The other types of liraglutide and semaglutide are not FDA approved for obesity. They're only FDA approved for diabetes. And so how do these medications work? So these medications have been revolutionary because they act centrally at the level of the brain, but they also act peripherally. So what they do is they act in the stomach to decrease gastric emptying. So what that means is food sits in your stomach longer. You feel full. They promote satiety, which is fullness at the level of the brain. And then they also act on the pancreas to improve and increase insulin secretion. And then they work on the liver to improve insulin sensitivity. So they really are having both a metabolic effect, a physical feeling of fullness effect, and then a promoting of satiety at the energy balance of our brain. And so what are the side effects? So there are common side effects that usually go away for most patients. And those are things like nausea, vomiting, dizziness, diarrhea, constipation, headache, fatigue, abdominal pain. These often happen when patients start the medication. We start on a low dose and up titrate very slowly. And usually those side effects go away. The nausea bit is because food just sits in your stomach longer. And so when you're counseling patients correctly and using this in someone who's been following healthy diet principles, we haven't actually seen this side effect be limiting for patients. It's more so in patients who are eating high fat, big meals that have more trouble with this side effect. And then what are the serious but rare side effects? So in less than 1% of patients, we see pancreatitis, cholecystitis, and suicidal ideation. While rare, these are very serious side effects, and it's important to counsel patients about these before starting the medication. So they know that this is a risk, and they also know to go to the emergency room if any of these things start happening. Contraindications. There's only two absolute contraindications for GLP-1 receptor agonist. 
One is the personal or family history of medullary thyroid cancer, and the other is pregnancy. So all medications for weight loss are contraindicated in pregnancy, but GLP-1 receptor agonists actually can harm the embryo and the fetus. So patients definitely can't be on them while pregnant. And we actually have a two month washout period where a patient has to stop these before attempting pregnancy because, they, the, because of the half-life of the medication. So what are the results? For Sixenda, the studies show a range of five to 10% body weight loss at one year. And then at three years, which is the maintenance period, we see about maintenance of 6% of that initial body weight loss. For Wagovi, we see 12.5% at one year and maintenance of 12.6%. So that's really great. At two years, people have lost, have maintained almost all of the weight they lost. Now, some of you may be saying, hey, that's not what I saw when I was reading the news. And you're right. So the, the news reports with the, the drug manufacturer's report, which is a higher weight loss percentage, closer to 15%. But you have to subtract out the placebo group. So the placebo effect was close to two and a half percent in the study. So what can you actually expect for weight loss? That would be 12 and a half percent. And how are Sixenda and Wagovi different? Well, you use them differently. So Sixenda is a daily injection and you can reach effective dose after five weeks. So it's not as slow of an up titration. Wagovi, on the other hand, is easier to use. It's a weekly injection, but it takes a lot longer to get to the max dose. It takes at the end of four months, so the beginning of the fifth month is when you're on the effective dose. I'm going to talk briefly about study design because I think it's super important to understand the context in which these medications were developed and studied before they were FDA approved, and also important for you all to understand what do those weight loss results really mean. So like I've said before, lifestyle change is key to the study design for every single medication that's ever been FDA approved for weight loss. Here's an example of Sixenda, which remember is the liraglutide. So in the studies that were done for Sixenda, there was a 12 week run-in phase. And so what that means is everybody who was enrolled in the study had to lose 5% of their body weight in 12 weeks before they were randomized to placebo or medication. So before someone was even allowed to take the medication for weight loss or the placebo, they had to lose at least 5% through lifestyle change. So through those diet and exercise things we had been discussing previously. So in, this, in the group that was studied, they actually did better than 5%. Those who met the metric on average lost 6% of their body weight loss in the first 12 weeks and then they were randomized to medication versus placebo. And in the group that got medication, they had an additional 6.8% of their weight loss, whereas the placebo group didn't have any additional weight loss. It's important to note that when you look at the intention to treat, which is everybody who was randomized to Sixenda, the weight loss was less at closer to 5%. And that 5% is more realistic because that group includes people who had to stop the medication because of things like side effects or other reasons why someone just might not want to keep taking an injection. So overall, if we look at the intention to treat with both lifestyle change and medication, we would see about 11% body weight loss. Buried in the website for Sixenda is this quote, which I think is very powerful. And it basically says, because losing at least 5% of body weight through lifestyle change was a requirement for continued participation in the randomization, the results of this study may not reflect those in the general population. So what does that mean? Basically, what they're saying is if people are not engaged in lifestyle change, we should not expect such high rates of weight loss. And this can be extrapolated and, you know, can be thought of for every other medication that's been FDA approved for weight loss, because they also all include lifestyle change. So kind of shifting a little bit to just discussing semaglutide, I'm going to take a second here because semaglutide is super popular right now. So there's two types of semaglutide. There's Wagovi and Ozempic. 
Well, Govi is FDA approved in weight loss. Ozempic is FDA approved for diabetes. Then when we look at Wagovi versus Sixenda, there's actually been a study that compared the two. And Wagovi is superior in effectively every metric. It's easier to, to use because it's just once a week. Patients lose more weight. They have longer maintenance of their weight loss and they have fewer side effects. So at all levels right now, Wagovi is superior to Sixenda. And because both are still on patent, they're both quite pricey. So there's not a real price differential that would favor one over the other. When it comes to cost, out of pocket, Wagovi is about $1,400 a month. Medicare does not cover any medications for weight loss. Medicare does cover medications for things like diabetes and impaired glucose tolerance. But when it comes just to weight loss alone and management of obesity on its own, Wagovi is most likely not going to be covered by Medicare. When it comes to duration, I said this initially, but I wanna talk about it a little bit more here. These medications are meant to be used for the long run. In the extension phase trials for Wagovi, they looked at people who stopped the medication after a year. So the initial study was about 1,200 people, and they looked at about 300 who stopped the medication after a year, and they re-examined their weight loss after one year of being off the Wagovi. And in that group of patients, they regained about two-thirds of the weight they had lost so their weight loss after one year was much lower at about 5%. And when we compare that to the group that stayed on the medication, that's a big difference. So those who stayed on the medication for that additional year maintained that 12.5% weight loss, whereas those who stopped were at about 5.5%. The, the sort of realist in me would like to see what that number looks like for those who stopped at the five and 10 year mark, because I suspect that they, most of those participants wouldn't even maintain that five and a half percent weight loss. So let's move on to Manjaro, which is a dual GIP and GLP-1 receptor agonist. This is a novel medication. The key here is it is not FDA approved for weight loss right now. It is only FDA approved for use in diabetes. So how does Manjaro work? It has the GLP-1 receptor agonist effects we discussed but then it had this added benefit of the GIP agonism. And so what GIP does is it increases lipolysis and fatty acid synthesis. So the thought is that maybe this, this bit of the medication will help us burn fat a little bit more than muscle and preserve some of that metabolism that we've been really trying to preserve through other mechanisms. So what are the facts here? So this is a novel diabetes drug. This is new. It's not FDA approved for obesity management. It's currently being fast-tracked through the FDA. So it may be any day now that it does get approval, but because it's such a new medication in the landscape of anything, I hesitate and I actually do not use it off-label for obesity medicine. In terms of dosing, it's also a weekly injection. And it's actually cheaper out of pocket right now than Wagovi at about $1,000 a month. And the results are astounding. So at one year, we see an 18% body weight loss. That is the most weight loss we've ever seen with a medication. And it approximates and actually surpasses a lot of the more intensive things we've done in the past, like meal replacement. And long-term, it may have better outcomes than something like the lap band, which has such high removal rates, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And again, to really you know, hit the nail on the head when it comes to study design, you know, deeply buried in the supplemental for the journal article that was published on terzepatide was part of the inclusion criteria. So who did they pick to be in the study? And one of the key parts was that part, the researchers had to feel like the participants were well motivated to follow lifestyle guidance, including dietary and exercise changes, as well as keep a study diary. So again, the people who were included in the study, the people who had this 18% body weight loss had to meet the bar of being, quote, well motivated and had to be 
following all of this lifestyle guidance to be included. So moving on to some other medications for weight loss, uh, one oral medication is Qsimia, which is a combination of low dose fentermine and topiramate. So how does this work? Well, they both, both fentermine and topiramate have very complicated mechanisms of action and they both work at the level of the brain to promote satiety. The side effects are the side effects you see mostly with these medications when they're used on their own. So things like constipation, dizziness, insomnia, paresthesia, which is like sort of odd sensations in your limbs, and then dyskusia, which is odd taste and smell. Because the fentermine dose is so low, we don't see those same cardiovascular effects that we saw when fentermine first hit the market in the 50s and then again in the 90s when it was being combined as fenfen. There are a few more absolute contraindications associated with Qsimia, hyperthyroidism, glaucoma, MAOI use in the last 14 days, as well as pregnancy. Topiramate is a teratogen, which means it's harmful to the fetus. So this could be very, very detrimental and dangerous in a woman who's pregnant. When it comes to results, we see good results with Qsimia. We see nine to 14% body weight loss at one year with maintenance of 10% body weight loss at the two-year mark. And in terms of dosing guidelines, this is a daily oral medication. We start with a low dose of fentramine 3.75 and topiramate of 23. And then after about four weeks, we get up to our first effective dose, which is the 7.546. We keep someone there for 12 weeks if they haven't lost three to 5% of their weight, then we up titrate to the max dose, which is 15 milligrams of fentramine and 92 of topiramate. And then another oral option for medication for weight loss is Contrave, which is a combination of bupropion and naltrexone. So bupropion may sound familiar uh, because it's also used for depression. And what bupropion does is it increases dopamine. And what dopamine does is it increases the reward sensation associated with eating, as well as just increasing you know, happiness in people in general. So what we know through fMRI studies is that when individuals with obesity are shown food cues, they have less dopamine response than an individual who is lean. So the theory is that perhaps individuals with obesity need more food cues, more food stimulation to have that same release of dopamine and have that same feeling of satiety. And so by increasing dopamine using bupropion, we're able to see that affect somewhat. What naltrexone does is it's an opioid antagonist and it also acts at the level of the hypothalamus to promote satiety. The side effects are contrave, are mostly the same side effects we see when we use bupropion for other uses. So things like nausea, constipation or diarrhea, insomnia, headaches, dizziness, dry mouth. It can worsen anxiety as well. And then the absolute contraindications are uncontrolled hypertension, seizure disorder, and then anything that may promote seizures. So things like restrictive eating disorder or alcohol withdrawal. Opioid abuse is also a contraindication as is pregnancy. Opioid use is not a contraindication, but if someone were to have a surgery or an accident where they needed opiates for pain control, the naltrexone would totally block those effects. So you should come off the contrave if someone needs to use that medication for pain control. What results do we see? When we look at those who completed the study, we see eight to 11% body weight loss at one year. But if we look at the intention to treat group, so everyone who was randomized to the medication, it's lower at five to 8%. And then the maintenance of weight loss at two years is not that great. It's around two to 5%. In terms of dosing, it's an oral pill and we up titrate it to two tablets a day, twice a day. So over the course of four weeks, we get to that max dose. So just to summarize, here's the list of FDA approved medications for weight loss and their 
weight loss side, their weight loss results. So Orlistat, which we didn't talk about, only has about 3% body weight loss, which is really not clinically meaningful. So I don't really prescribe that. With Contrave, we can see about 5 to 8% at one year with maintenance up to 5% at two years. Sixenda, which is the GLP-1 receptor agonist, we see 5 to 10% at one year with maintenance of 6% at two years. Cusimia, which is an oral pill, we see 9 to 14% body weight loss with 10% maintenance at two years. And then with Wagovi, the other GLP-1 receptor agonist, we see 12.5% weight loss initially with maintenance of 12.6% at two years. So now let's transition to surgeries for weight loss. So the indication for surgery has changed. These guidelines were updated in December. So now the BMI cutoffs are actually lower. So Surgery for weight loss is indicated for individuals with a BMI of greater than or equal to 35, so that's class two obesity or higher, or individuals with a BMI greater than or equal to 30 with a comorbidity. Medical weight management is a necessity prior to surgery, so insurance companies want to see that people have been engaging in some type of lifestyle change for at least six months leading up to surgery. And the key to explain to your patients is that surgery requires lifelong lifestyle change, as well as lifelong mineral and vitamin supplementation and monitoring. A big positive of surgery, of some of the surgeries for weight loss, is that we can see reversal of diabetes and other metabolic disease, which is really, really amazing. But diabetes may recur in up to 20% of patients. So here are the surgical options. First, we have the sleeve gastrectomy, which is the most common procedure we see for weight loss. About 60% of surgeries for weight loss are the sleeve. And what we do with, with what the surgeons do for the sleeve is they remove a big portion of the stomach. And what we see is 50 to 70% of excess body weight loss with over 50% of body weight loss maintained at the five to 10 year mark. We see improvement in metabolic disease like diabetes and high cholesterol, but rates of diabetes can, uh, recur in about 20, 25% of patients. Gastric bypass surgery is the next most common surgery for weight loss. It's about 18% of the surgeries that are done. And with this, it's a little bit more of a complicated surgery. So you're removing a part of the stomach and actually rerouting the anatomy of the small intestine. And so with a more intensive surgery, we see higher rates of weight loss at about 60 to 80%. We see even more rates of improvements in things like diabetes and hyperlipidemia with lower rates of recurrence of these diseases. But on the flip side, we see higher side effects and higher rates of surgical complication. Gastric banding used to be more common, but it's really falling out of favor with only 1% of surgeries for weight loss being gastric banding. And the reason why it's falling out of favor is because there's very, very high rates of removal. So at the five to 10 year mark, up to 40% of bands are removed worldwide. And so there's not good long-term maintenance of weight loss. We also don't see any improvement of metabolic disease. Biliopancreatic diversion is the last surgical option for weight loss. It's also very rare. It's only about 1% of cases. And it's an even more complicated surgery than in gastric bypass. And so there's even more rerouting of the small intestine. And again, with an even more complicated surgery comes even more weight loss and even more chance of improving your metabolic disease. But the reason it's done so rarely is because it has high rates of surgical complication and it has really high rates of mineral and vitamin deficiency. As you can see, these numbers, these percentages do not add up to 100. So the remaining surgeries for weight loss that are done each year are usually revision surgeries. So if someone's sleeve dilates and they're going to revise it or convert something like a sleeve to a gastric bypass. And so that's all we have today. So just to review our objectives, I hope that after this talk today, you understand why we use BMI and why we should be critical of it. I hope you can tell somebody or reflect yourself and understand what is the way we should be eating and how can diet impact our weight loss. 
And I hope you understand the role of exercise in maintenance of weight loss and weight management. I hope you can walk away understanding what the various medications are and how well they work in patients. And I hope you have a very rudimentary understanding of the various surgical options for weight loss. Terrific, that was, that was outstanding. Um, we have a, a couple of questions coming in, but let me start with a few. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, the use of tracking apps uh, as a way to facilitate uh, uh, calorie restrictive diets? Tracking, when we look at the studies for weight loss, Tracking is really the one of the best things to do, and there's multiple reasons. So one is it can really help with calorie restriction. So it can help people have goals around how people actually see how they're close they are to their calorie goal. But beyond just calorie counting, tracking is super helpful with mindfulness. So when I talked about us eating for other reasons other than energy homeostasis, the tracking bit can help a lot with that mindfulness and help us understand the patterns of why we're eating, when we're eating, how much we're eating, and unpack some of those habits that are associated with eating for reasons other than hunger. A second question has to do with uh, the medications, the GLP-1 um, receptor antagonist, uh, agonist. There's also an oral form uh, that we use in diabetes. Um, has that been studied for weight loss and uh, how much weight loss is associated with that? Yeah, so there are a few. Um, they have not been studied as much in weight loss. I mean, if you go on Quora, patients talk a ton about it, but the data is just not there for the weight loss studies. And I haven't really seen that it's being studied to be FDA approved. It's closer to something like metformin, where if it's going to work for patients, we might see weight loss, and it's definitely going to be weight neutral in our diabetics. Um, but yeah, like exenatide, ribelsis, those things, we we just aren't, we don't use them. And I, I, I haven't seen much data suggesting that we might start. Uh, in the reference to um, macronutrients, uh, so what you're saying is that carbohydrate restriction is no longer thought to be superior for weight loss. Correct. Yeah, that's correct. I think, you know, you have to look at every patient as an individual. And when someone comes to you wanting to be on a diet, or if you yourself are interested in a diet, the question, my first question is always why? And if there's a compelling reason, and the reason could just be, it's easier for me to follow something when there are more rules, or I strongly believe in this helping my body, then yeah, let's do it. But if the reason is not based in science or facts, and because you know the myth is that it's superior, that's what we want to dispel. We want to make sure people are doing things it, with all of the knowledge at hand, and then supporting them through whatever resonates the most with them. Um, maybe a final question about fermented foods. Uh, you mentioned that it improves the gut microbiome. Uh, is there a greater variety of microbes you could get from eating a variety of fermented foods? Yes. So the more types of fermented foods you eat, the better range of my, like probiotics you're going to have, and it's going to be better for your microbiome. So yogurt has the highest concentration of probiotics. So even just getting different brands of yogurt, and I didn't say this explicitly, but you don't want to get yogurt that's sweetened because the sugar kind of detracts from the proliferation of those healthy bacteria. So you want to get plain yogurt or um, plain kefir, things like that, kombucha, sauerkraut, all of those things. If you can incorporate different types of probiotics and have them be as unprocessed as possible, that's going to be the best for your microbiome. Fantastic. Well, I think we've done it. Uh, that was really a terrific job. And with that, again, let me thank Dr. Thiara and uh, thank you all for your attention and uh, wish you all a good night. <music>